So this is me. I'm Jan Willem Janssen. I'm a software architect at Luminous Technologies. Um, currently working at two projects, Bozon and Amdatu, hence the shirts. And I'm an active committer and PMC member of the Apache Felix and Apache Ace projects. And my name is uh, Marcel Offermans. I'm uh, the director at Luminous Technologies and also a fellow at Luminous. And currently working on Amdatu. Uh, short introduction, Amdatu is an open source project, Apache licensed, and contains many different components for building web-based, cloud-based, OSGI applications. So all kinds of useful stuff if you're doing that. And I'm also a member of the Apache Software Foundation and committer and PMC member on both Felix and Ace and mentoring the Celix project. So let's first start with going through the agenda for this talk. Um, we'll start out with a short introduction and motivation on why modular web applications are even worth having. having. Uh, and then go on to telling you about the sort of current state, uh, state of the art, what's been standardized up till now, and how you can use that. Uh, and you'll quickly see that uh, there are some parts missing. Uh, not everything that we currently would like to use has been standardized yet. So we'll go into some of the available extensions after that, just to give you a broad overview of what's available. And then we'll go to the new HTTP specification, still in progress, uh, show you some of that, and then some of the new extensions, the more uh, advanced stuff, we'll have some demos of those as well. And finish off with uh, some pointers for future work, what are we working on at Felix, and then finally a wrap up. But let's first start by explaining a little bit more about modular web applications, or maybe in general, why build modular applications at all. Um, most importantly, I think, if you start out with a modular architecture, you'll, have, you'll gain some advantages over a non-modular architecture. Um, if you start designing your modules with high cohesion, low coupling, you'll end up with, with modules that are a lot easier uh, to maintain, even in the long term. Um, we've heard in some talks earlier today about people, after a few years building on an application, becoming more and more afraid of changing things because it becomes harder to, to really understand the impact of changes because they sort of ripple through the system more and more. So uh, building modular applications helps out with that. And you might even end up with some modules that are reusable over different projects that you do. So that's also a big benefit once you start doing this. Um, all of these are not specific to web applications, but uh, I think a good point to make is that once you start going the modular route, you should also build your web applications in a more modular way. Uh, so that's why we use OSGI for building web applications. And another thing to look at is the deployment side. Um, once you start deploying modular applications, uh, you actually get the benefit that you can compose all these modules in different ways. And maybe if you have a standardized product, customers will always want to have little custom changes to their version of the standard product. And by using, the, uh, by using modules, you can more easily isolate such changes and uh, keep your application like 99% standard and maybe a little bit customized. Um, and once you actually start doing updates, another benefit is that uh, you only need to update the modules that have actually changed. So you don't need to completely redeploy your EAR or WAR file, just the small modules that you have actually changed. So that saves a lot of bandwidth. And with OSGI, the runtime container also allows you to make uh, such changes without actually stopping your application. So some parts might be down for a very brief moment, but most of the application will just keep running. So that is also an interesting benefit. And with that, I'll hand over to Jan Willem to talk a little bit more about current state. So the current state, um, as Marcel mentioned, the Felix HTTP service is a standard provided by the OGI Alliance. It provides you 
an interface where you can register a couple of things. Currently, servlets and resources, your static resources, you can unregister them. And the immediate thing you show, see is that you need explicit registration. So first you need to obtain the HTTP service in order to register your servlet. That's a bit different than, for example, you're used to in a normal WAR file, because there you declare what servlets you want to have running on what endpoints, and then simply the web application server will provide those services on those endpoints once it starts your WAR file. So that's one of the things that will change in the future, but we'll come back to that later. So as mentioned, you can register servlets, and you need to explicitly register them. So how does that work? It's a bit dark. I hope you can see it on your local screens better. Um, you have a register servlet, and in the first parameter, you give it the endpoint. In this case, the slash hello, followed by the second par uh, parameter that is the actual servlet implementation. And the third and fourth parameters are uh, optional. The first one is allows you to provide additional initialization parameters to your servlet, like you're used to in, in a normal WAR file. And the last one allows you to provide HTTP context. What that exactly is, I will come back to that later on. So as this is running on an actual web server, let's invoke it. So I have here printed out the results of the invocation and you see that it's nicely printing out the stuff that's written in the servlet code. On to resources. Resources is everything that's static, that doesn't change. So your files, your images, your CSS files, whatever. To register those, you have a slightly different method. It looks remarkably similar to the servlet version. The first one is the endpoint on which the web resource should be registered. And the second path is the local path in your bundle where the resource can be found. So in this case, everything that's following slash site will be mapped to internally the path slash resources slash. Again, the last parameter is an HTTP context. And again, we'll come back to that later. So if I have, for example, a simple hello file on my resources folder that's uh, containing a static uh, text. And if I'm going to invoke that one, you see that it simply prints out the contents of that file. So onto that magical HTTP context object. This context allows you to provide a kind of grouping functionality. It allows you to, to give a single context to several of your servlets that you register. The reason you might do that is, for example, to handle security. So that's the reason why, for example, handle security method is on there. For each servlet that has an HTTP context, by default every servlet gets an HTTP context, if you implement the handle security method yourself, you can control whether the request is proceeded to your actual servlet by returning simple true or false. And it also allows you to, for example, in case of basic authentication, to set some response headers and ensure that the client comes back with the proper authentication credentials. Another way to use the HTTP context is to serve static resources. So you can, in fact, for each resources that the service doesn't know about, that's not an actual servlet, it will call the get resource on your HTTP context and you can fill out yourself which resource you to return. And the last method is the MIME type. It allows you to provide information about the actual contents as a hint to the browser what to do with the actual content. 
So those are the three basic components that the current HTTP service provides. Another specification that's currently available, and not used that much, I think, but is the web application specification, the enterprise edition uh, specification. And it allows you to deploy normal WAR files. I put it in quotes because it, you need to change a bit in your WAR file. You, uh, you make your WAR file like you normally do, but you place an additional metadata header in your bundle context, of, uh, in your meta, of, uh, manifest, to ensure that um, the uh, uh, OGI framework can pick it up and recognize it as such as a web application. So you still have everything inside one single archive, your WAR file. And the uh, web application server al uh, allows you to register it on a certain context. It allows you to register multiple servlets like any normal web uh, container in normal plain G2EE context will provide you. So this is the current status of the specification of the standards that's out there currently. Let's look at the available extensions. Okay. Um, there are many, and I'm not going to go through all of them because there's just too many uh, around, but I'll take a few of them and show you what they're used for. And I'll start out with uh, one of the most popular ones, which is the actual whiteboard service. And Whiteboard is a design pattern that's used in OCI a lot. Uh, summarized nicely by the sentence, don't call us, we'll call you. It's more or less another way to do uh, listeners, uh, but doing listeners in OSGI is uh, not that convenient. Um, it's easier to sort of swap uh, the way uh, you use those around. And what you actually do uh, with whiteboard style servlets, for example, is that you directly register your servlet as an OSGI service in the registry. And if you have an HTTP service available, it will simply listen to the registry and pick up any servlet that it finds there and register it at the correct endpoint. And the endpoint is specified as a property for this service. So only register the service at the endpoint and it will get picked up. And uh, that's already a little bit easier and uh, looks a little bit more like you were used to declaring your service, ser servlets this way. So the whiteboard is currently available within Felix as an extension. You can just install that bundle and you'll have this capability. And it goes a little bit further than that. Um, it also allows you to uh, register filters. Uh, we haven't discussed those yet because the current specification doesn't support filters, but since they're used a lot in, in web applications, uh, the whiteboard that we created also allows you to register filters in much the same way. So you can just register them in the registry and you'll find. Alternatively, depending on your implementation of uh, the HTTP service, there might also be some extended versions of HTTP service available in the registry. Uh, for Felix HTTP, we've called it ext HTTP service. If you use a different container like Pax Web, it's called a little bit different, but it has the same features. And there you can also explicitly register filters. I wouldn't do uh, that uh, because in the future we're probably going more whiteboard style for everything. So uh, I'd advise you to stick with that uh, for now. It's more future proof. Uh, another component that you can use is the Amdatu web resource bundle. Uh, this makes it a little bit easier to register static resources. Uh, Jan Willem just showed you that you can register them by talking to the HTTP service. So there's still some stuff that you need to do to register them. Uh, you have to write some code. If you don't like that, you can also just stick them in a bundle, add a few extra headers to your bundle, and I've printed them here. Uh, and if you have the web resources bundle installed, it'll simply pick up on those. It's sort of an extender pattern. Uh, so it allows you to just declare these resources 
and uh, they will be made available. So no more writing Java code just to expose some resources. It also has some features like uh, support for handling uh, default pages like an index.html and if you want to have different index for some subdirectory you can even indicate that. Uh, as a simple example, let's try it out again. Probably know where this is going. We just request a static resource from this bundle and again it will be served and we didn't have to do any Java code to make this happen. So that's um, static resources, not that terribly exciting. Becomes more interesting when we start to do something like REST services. Uh, probably everybody does them somewhere in their application. And uh, if you're used to Java EE, you're probably also used to using annotations based on the JAX-RS specification. Uh, that's not supported out of the box in OSGI, so we made a bundle for that as well, uh, which basically allows you to just use the same annotations on any service that you publish into the OSGI service registry. It will be picked up and published as a REST endpoint. Um, we also support Jackson mappings out of the box, but if you want to use something else for that, you can plug something else in that's, that's all flexible. And we have some nice self-documentation available if you like that using a library called Swagger. I'll show that in a, in a moment. Let's first take a look at these, uh, these annotations. Well, if you're already familiar with uh, JAX-RS, uh, you'll find this example easy to read. Uh, if not, you can probably make up what it does. Uh, anyway, we just created an endpoint with uh, a, a get and a post method here. And using the annotations, we can tell the web server what to do with this, how to parse all the parameters, etc. Uh, so that's all we need to do. Just publish this as an OSGI service, and it will become an endpoint. So uh, briefly mentioned, we can also generate documentation uh, for these uh, annotated services. In fact, we added uh, some annotations just to make documenting such endpoints easier. Um, we're using a library called Swagger to, at runtime, parse these annotations and generate documentation. And that is uh, very convenient if you have front-end developers that want to see the actual documentation of the current version, not having to do all of that on paper, but just having it as part of your application uh, as a separate bundle. So once you go to production, you probably leave that out again, unless you have people that develop stuff against your production server as well. And uh, that, that gives you a nice documentation. So let's quickly take a look at that. If we go here, we see the documentation for the REST endpoint that we just created. In fact, we added an extra method. Uh, and uh, we can just click on any of these, for example, the get method. And we get some more details about what it does. And we can even just try it out here on the spot, see what happens. And we nicely see a response body here, code and headers. Same goes for these other two. This one just returns plain text. And we have a post method. And we can try that out. We even have a default response here, but I can change that a little bit if I want. And again, we immediately see what happens when we execute that. So that's very convenient if you're doing a lot of REST endpoints. Yeah, slightly fighting with my mouse here, sorry about that. No, you have to focus on it. focus on this slider. Good. That's a nice break to the new specification. Um, it's internally known in the OSGI Alliance as RFC 189. That's not that important. It's currently still work in progress, has not been released yet, so I didn't put any official release date on the slides, but it should be released fairly soon. 
Um, as soon as it is, uh, we will also have a reference implementation available, and that will be part of Apache Felix as well. Um, actually, uh, Karsten will be also working on that a little bit, I guess, and uh, Jan Willem as well. So uh, we're already working towards implementing that as we speak. And this new specification will standardize a couple of things that we've already seen. Um, let's start with the whiteboard surface. Uh, this is then no longer an extension. It will be part of the HTTP service. So no longer do you need to explicitly register servlets and uh, filters. Uh, you can simply use the whiteboard. Just to show you an example, um, you simply specify a couple of properties again. Uh, for example, the, uh, the endpoint for your servlet. And in this case, we also uh, specified a filter condition. Uh, the filter condition you can use in the scenario where you might have more than one HTTP server, because you might have an external HTTP server, maybe some internal one for management or something like that. And if you have more than one, you probably want to specify for which server this servlet is meant. So you can use filter conditions for that. And uh, apart from the fact that the property names have been changed a little bit from what we've been using before, everything's the same. And it's very likely that we'll keep supporting both the new and the old property names for some time, uh, just to ease the transition into this new specification. Another cool new thing is that we now support the Servlet 3.0 API. For some people, that's already very old. Uh, but for OSGI, it's, it's new. And it's good that we have it now. And apart from normal servlets, this also means that we are supporting asynchronous servlets now. Uh, again, just a, a short example of that. Uh, an asynchronous servlet uh, will probably implement a get or post or whatever method. And the get simply starts an asynchronous context uh, and uh, immediately returns. And this asynchronous context then does all the real work, and when it's done, it responds back to the client. So that's just supported now, it's nothing new. And, uh, well, here we see how you can uh, register uh, such an asynchronous servlet. There's a little extra property that you need to put in to state that this is an asynchronous servlet. And we do that, I think, mainly to indicate to the web server that it should check whether it supports asynchronous servlets or not. So. so another thing we now support whiteboard style is filters. Not that much to say, we just fully support them now. And just to give you a quick example again, again, similar properties to what we've seen before. Um, and uh, the Filter is simply registered, again, whiteboard style, and that's it. Another new thing are listeners. Uh, also, they are just supported. Uh, all the events that you can normally listen to, you can also listen to in the OSGI context. And as a simple example of listeners, we have this one here, uh, which uh, uh, listens to uh, uh, servlet context being initialized and destroyed, and thus a few things. Uh, I think, I'm not sure if we have that even in the code that we have, but at least it's on the slides, so you can try it out yourself. And another one, maybe also not that exciting, is custom arrow pages. Uh, we didn't have those, uh, but uh, now we can just show arrow pages based on either error codes that you get back or specific exceptions. And the idea is that you can register a servlet for those. In the properties, you can specify which error codes and which exceptions that you want this servlet to respond to. And it will be just be invoked in those cases. And you can give the user a nice message or something like that. So. Now we've seen all the extensions, uh, uh, the, 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 the cool new stuff that will be in the new specification.
let's so go on into the extensions that will be possible now. Um, since we've upgraded internally also to one of the later versions of Jetty, a couple of new things will become available to us. And um, one of those is WebSockets. For those who haven't heard of WebSockets yet, it's um, an RFC. It's standardized. And it allows you to provide a raw TCP-based communication channel for browser-based applications. So you can use it for real, near real-time communication between the browser and the server. Um, this provides an alternative to existing alternatives like long polling or um, Ajax Comet kind of techniques that are mostly used before WebSockets. Um, and an alternative to WebSockets, which also could work if you only want one-way communication from server to client is server-sent events. But anyway, um, the WebSockets uh, will be, uh, become available um, in the new Felix implementation. And to give you an example, oh, sorry, wrong button, how this looks like. This is nowhere readable, but I'll talk you through. The First line, a couple of lines are the client side, the JavaScript. So here you simply create a new WebSocket using the WS protocol, indicating that you want to create a WebSocket with a location and a path. And the last parameter allows you to specify one or more protocols, symbolic names for protocols that you want to connect to. And then you can simply add callback messages. For example, on each message that happens on this WebSocket, you can invoke this function that handles the data. The lower part shows how this works on the server side. For this example, we're using uh, a Jetty 8 implementation, which is not yet standardized. Uh, there is an uh, GSR 356, I believe, that standardizes WebSockets for Java. So it gives you a standardized API to work with WebSockets on the server side. Uh, currently, we're not supporting that yet. We hope in the future, but for now, we're using the uh, Yeti specific implementation of, uh, of that API. Um, it simply allows you to extend from a common base class provided by Yeti, and you need to in implement a specific method, do web connect, WebSocket connect. And there you can con control which protocol you want to support. And if you support it, then you simply return a WebSocket interface or implementation. If you don't support it, you can simply return null. And that is the indication for, in, at least for Jetty, to give an error code back to the client, the calling client, and the error calling client will handle it for its own. So we have a demo. If you have your laptops open, you can click the link, and we can do a nice painting. So let's change some colors. You see there are a couple of users already going back and forth. Over. And this is all based, made on Oh, you're really painting uh, something, Marcia. Yeah. Anyway, so this is a typical example of how to use WebSockets. It's actually, uh, I ripped it off the internet and modified it slightly for this presentation. All the code for this uh, presentation, including the slides, will become available online. So, on to the presentation. Speedy. Speedy is an initiative originally started by Google by their program, Let's Make the Web Faster. And since they're quite a big company that does a lot of the web content provisioning currently, they have a case to make the web a slightly, slightly faster. So they've designed a new protocol, a session layer on top of, uh, of SSL for security. 
And one of the main goals of SPD protocol is to reduce bandwidth and lower latencies and provide all kinds of things to make it even quicker to handle requests from browsers. One of those things is, for example, to push multiple resources in one request. Yeah, if a browser requests an index page, an HTML page, which has a, a style sheet and probably some JavaScript associated to it, then probably you want to have those as well. And the Speedy protocol allows you to provide the style sheet and the JavaScript in a single request back to the browser so that the browser can get all the resources in one request without having to go back and forth three or more times. Speedy will also be uh, one of the foundations for the upcoming HTTP 2.0 specification. They're currently working on that and, um, well, Google has already made this specification, but it will be ratified into a more formal specification. I believe the RFC, whatever will be, be made of it. And it will be made uh, uh, open for everybody. So it's no longer a Google thing, but everybody can implement it. So to give you an idea where Speedy lives in the OCI reference model, OCI, OCI reference model, we have our HSL on the presentation layer and we have HTTP on the application layer and Speedy sits in between those. So it really provides you a session that also allows you to uh, multiplex multiple requests in a single uh, uh, communication channel. And if you want, because it is an entire completely specified protocol, you can also skip the entire HTTP layer and simply talk directly Speedy, only Speedy, if your client supports it. It will provide you all the same advantages as HTTP on Speedy, but you can also make back and forth communication directly by directional communication between client and server, kind of like WebSockets. So I've been talking about Speedy WebSockets. You might be thinking, hmm, this kind of look like similar to me. So I've made a little table which hopefully explains the difference between both. First of all, they have different goals. Speedy is really aimed at optimizing HTTP, while WebSockets is simply providing a bi-directional communication channel between browsers and servers. Upgradability for clients that support Speedy, it's completely transparent. So they don't have to change anything to their code. Well, WebSockets obviously do need a change of code. You simply need to open the connection and do something with it. Security, well, both supported. For Speedy, it's mandatory. It's built on top of SSL. For WebSockets, it's optional. You can choose whether or not you want a secure communication layer. Two-way, yeah, well, for Speedy, both are supported. Plain HTTP obviously does not support bi-directional communication, but if you are willing to leave that out and you go straight to talking speedy, then you have two-way communication. And obviously WebSockets is built for two-way communication, so it supports it. Multiplexing, you can multiply requests in a single connection. One of the examples was the push example. With WebSockets, yeah, you can do it, but you're on your own. You have to build something to support it. And one other thing that Speedy supports is prioritization of requests. There are a couple of bits reserved in each message that allows you to set a priority to a message so a Speedy client knows that some messages might have a higher priority than other messages. Again, a demo. How are we with the time? It's at the click. I've written a small uh, web page containing an image and 
in the back side there's also a JavaScript loaded and of course HTML and by default it's running on for HTTP slash one connection and if I switch to using speedy then the numbers are a little bit off it's hard to measure this in such a way that you see the actual advantage of speedy that's go word for it <laughs> <laughs> or Google's word for it but at least um, here you see I've installed a little plugin that um, shows you whether or not speedy is currently in use and if it's a green lighting bolt then speedy is in use and if I switch again to normal then you see it's a gray lighting bolt indicating that plain HTTP is used Sorry? Uh, yeah. No, not in this de demonstration. But there are demos, demos online. If you search for two-way communication speedy, then you can find the demonstration. I've, I've seen it. Oh. Let's close this one. So on to the future work, what needs to be done. We've talked a lot, we've shown you a lot. Well, we need to, of course, to form, finalize the support for the HTTP service specification, the new one. It's not yet completely finalized. Some ding of dance may change yet, but at least it's mostly stable right now, so we need to go on, implement the last things that need to be done. To get fully support of the new WebSocket API, the standard one that's provided by Java, and the latest version of Speedy, we would like to upgrade to Yeti 9. As I said, we would also provide by default a convenience to support WebSockets, the new WebSockets, GSR 356, and again, the improved Web Speedy support. Jan Willem, for those who are not aware, why are we not upgrading to Jetty 9 right now? Uh, Jetty oh. 9 requires us to also upgrade to at least Java 7. And we have quite a lot of users who are not yet willing to make the step from Java 6 to Java 7. Carsten has some first-hand experience with some of those. So that's sort of the trade-off and discussion that we're having, uh, whether we want to make that move right now so we're also discussing, perhaps we'll make this configurable so uh, the Felix HTTP uh, allows you to plug in both Jetty 8 and Jetty 9, and uh, that will also allow you to keep using most of these features on uh, Java 6. So that's probably where we're heading right now, uh, and that explains why we're not just going to uh, Jetty 9, which would be the obvious uh, thing to do. Yeah, thank you. So to wrap up, I believe that's exactly on time or not? <laughs> Ten, minutes. Ten minutes, okay, well, then we are. To wrap up, we have shown you the new and the updates of the HTTP service specification. Uh, we've see, shown you the upcoming features, functionalities, and improvements that we've made to the HTTP service. And we've shown you what extensions will become available by the new specification and the fact that we are currently using a new, newer version of Yeti. And we hopefully give you a brief idea how to make and build your own modular web applications. And that makes us to the question rounds. Any questions? Yeah. So the question is whether GSP, GSF are supported. Um, actually, the web archive, the, the, the web, the web application specification I mentioned in the beginning, does provide optional support for GSPs. Um, GSF is not supported. And that's, I think, on purpose because of the lifecycle thingies. I'm, 
But no, so it's go go speak to Karsten to make a formal request to add GSF support. Yeah, I think in general, I mean, uh, a lot of web frameworks have been uh, uh, transferred to OSGI, and most of them do work. Uh, depending on how these frameworks have been set up, uh, it's a little bit easier or harder to do. Uh, it's usually harder, for example, if you have struts which has fairly static XML configurations that link everything together. And you can still use it, but it's harder to modularize your web application that way. Uh, technology, for example, like Wicket is more dynamic in that sense. It allows you to, to easily break up your application into smaller components and have them uh, served by different bundles and still have them work together. So in general, if you want to try out one of these technologies in OSGI, ask the Felix mailing list. Probably there's somebody who has already done it there or, or can tell you why it doesn't work. Uh, so that's usually a good path to take then. Currently, the implementation provides Jetty as a default implementation of a, a web server. It's also possible to rip Yeti entirely out and, for example, to bridge it to your native Tomcat. So you can all use all the advantages that Tomcat gives you. And it takes a little effort, but I think it's doable to bring your own web server inside as well. And there's even an alternative implementation in Felix already for HTTP service that's entirely customly written. Yeah, it's very lightweight, yeah. uh, more geared towards embedded solutions where you have very little space. And, uh, so it's a fairly simple implementation, probably doesn't support all the fancy stuff right yeah. now. So there's different choices out there. Yeah. Uh, you're not stuck to using Jetty. Yeah. And yeah, especially if you're embedding uh, your whole OSGI framework, for example, inside a WAR file, you can bridge it so it will use the web server that's used by your application server. Yeah. So that's always a, a way out to use whatever you will use. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Any more questions? Nope. No. Then uh, we're done, I guess. The only thing left is to provide you some links, of course. First of all, the Felix project, felix.apache.org. This is our website, luministechnologies.com. If you want to de series develop with OGI in Eclipse, then you probably should want BND tools as a plugin to simplify all the things. All the Amdato projects are grouped on amdato.org. And lastly, the code for this presentation can be found on Bitbucket. Please give us five minutes because I think we have still set the repository to private. We need to open it up. So yeah, we have oh. five minutes. So at the end of the presentation, <laughs> it will be available. Yeah. And it's a complete uh, Eclipse workspace. It needs BND tools. Uh, but you can just check it out and go through the slides and examples there. Yeah. So. And provide the presentation to your friends, of course. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Thanks. <laughs>